in the year of the COVID-19 pandemic, students in my courses at the University of Florida would have seen this image in the background during our Zoom sessions. It's a painting by the Dutch post-impressionist painter Vincent van Gogh called Tree Roots. It's one of a series of Van Gogh paintings in this genre known as sous bois. That's French for forest floor or undergrowth. This one is unique in at least two respects. We believe it was the last painting Van Gogh done. He was painting it on the morning or the afternoon of July 27th, 1890. Later that evening, overcome with his worsening depression, he shot himself with a revolver. He would die of his injuries two days later. In 2020, art historian Walter van der Veen made a remarkable discovery. Tree Roots depicts a precise place in the small French town of auvers sur oise where Van Hoek was living during the final months of his life. This is a composite image of the painting and a photograph taken of the spot about 1900. The heavily eroded embankment you see here and the trees, they were about 150 yards away from the hotel where Van Hoek was living at the time. This tangle of color, this exuberant expression of form and space this was, and more than a century later, it still is, a real place. I want to begin today with a simple observation that Van Hoek's beautiful, sorrowful painting is the product of a soul in deep crisis and an extraordinary expression of the power of the human imagination to capture and recreate reality. Tree roots, an image of a real and a more than real place, is an example of the crossing of observation and creation that I call vital connectivity and today I want to talk with you about the importance of vital connectivity in the age of climate crisis. The Earth's climate is changing. Perhaps you've seen this animation by NASA of anomalous surface temperatures since 1880. As median temperatures rise, anomalous weather, superstorms, floods, droughts, wildfires are becoming more common and more destructive. Polar and glacial ice are melting. Sea levels are rising. We face in the coming century a planetary ecosystem without precedent in human memory. For millions of our human kin and countless numbers of our non-human kin, the catastrophe has already arrived. Now, vital connectivity, this exuberant crossing of creation and observation, it's not going to slow or reverse the effects of global warming. But I do believe that a better understanding of its potentials can enrich and extend our understanding of our place in the world to come. Because we've done this before. This is something we as a species are really good at. Let me show you an example of what I mean. The ancestors of the Aboriginal peoples and Torres Islander Strait peoples, Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia, left Africa at the end of the, um, the late Pleistocene epoch, about 75,000 years ago. They arrived on the Australian continent about 10,000 years later. At the end of the last glacial period and the beginning of the Holocene epoch, 11,700 years ago, they were effectively cut off from other human populations as the vast ice packs of the northern and the southern hemisphere began to melt and the continent was encircled by rising seas. This is a map showing the extent of the sea level rise. The yellow border is the boundary of the continent before the rise and the darker interior is its boundary as the rise tapered off about 7,000 years ago. 
the Aboriginal peoples who settled on the perimeter of the continent were faced by enormous challenges in the post-glacial age. In the space of a few thousand years, sea levels rose by 400 feet. The shorelines receded by hundreds of miles. Islands offshore disappeared. Peninsulas were turned into chains of islands. Freshwater deltas were consumed completely by rising saltwaters. We know from the extensive archaeological evidence that the Aboriginal peoples were forced to move inland to higher and drier ground. And we know that they created stories to explain what was happening to them. Anthropologist Patrick Nunn has called these the oldest true stories in the world. He and his team have identified 21 locations on the perimeter of the continent where very old oral narratives clearly describe seawater inundation. Some of these stories will seem very matter of fact to us. An island offshore is described as having been connected by a land bridge that's now underwater. Others will seem more fantastic. For example, two brothers struggle over a magical water bag. It bursts, its contents spill on the ground, and a coastal plain is immersed. Or a giant kangaroo plunges a digging stick into the soil, cuts a trench, which opens to a channel and then opens to a great gulf in the sea. These changes were reflected also in the art of the period. This is an image of the rainbow serpent, an important Aboriginal deity that first appeared about 6,000 years ago in ancient rock paintings like this one in Arnhem Land, Northern Territory. Aboriginal mythology has long associated the rainbow serpent with the movements of water and seasonal rains. Anthropologist Paul Tasson has proposed that the curious anatomy of the serpent is based upon that of the ribbon pipefish, Haliichthys taniophorus, a saltwater species commonly found in the waters north of the Australian continent. And pipefish like this one would have been carried in by the inland incursion of saltwater. Stories of magical water bags, giant kangaroos, mystical serpents may not seem much to us today like precise observations of environmental transformation. But Nunn and his team have shown that the hydrological crises described in the Aboriginal myths correspond very closely to the geological evidence for how the shorelines actually receded. And Tasson's insight is that the rainbow serpent represents the origin story of a creature the Aboriginal peoples had never seen before and which soon became the emblem of a radically new ecosystem they were now forced to live in. I want to be clear about one thing, however. To compare in this way seemingly realistic and fantastic elements of the Aboriginal stories does not reduce the majesty or the expressive power of their mythology. I think it does the reverse. It advances fact through myth-making into something far more meaningful and more enduring. It subjects fact and myth to the synergies of vital connectivity. Let me tell you about another example. This is a grove of quaking aspens, Populus tremuloides, growing now, today, on about 108 acres on a hillside in south central Utah. It's called pando, from the Latin for I spread. And the name is very apt. Pando is what's called a clonal colony. Each of the 47,000 trees in the grove is a genetically identical clone sprung from the roots of a single parent. Pando is, in fact, one vastly interconnected organism running beneath the forest floor. It weighs more than six million kilograms. It's the most massive living being on our planet. 
And it's also one of the oldest, at least as old as the last glacial maximum in North America some 16,000 years ago. Which means when the Aboriginal peoples were telling their stories of sea level rise for the first time, Panda was only an adolescent. The Grove figures prominently in Richard Power's 2018 novel, The Overstory, one of the most celebrated works of American environmental fiction of the last several decades. It's the story of nine humans whose lives are drawn together by their shared passion for the welfare of trees, which Powers rightfully calls the most wondrous products of four billion years of life and the terrible tragic consequences of those humans' failure to protect old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest from clear cutting and climate change. Pando appears early in the novel when one of the characters passes through it. The narrator remarks on the grove's age, its size, its strange plural selfhood. And then something really marvelous happens, the kind of thing that an English professor really likes. The narrative begins to skip between brief episodes in the lives of the individual human characters. And we learn that in each case, other Aspens, far from Pando, played a role, small or large, in their life. And that all of the humans are bound together over the course of the novel by this hidden network of trees. It's exactly like a Subois painting. For a moment, we see the extraordinary undergrowth that sustains the entire novel. Everything is of a whole and richly, immensely complex. A couple of years ago, I was teaching this novel to a class of undergrads, and I observed in passing that this passage is an example of how connections in the story world can reach out to the real world and reveal their potential cross-pollinations. One of my students frowned a bit at that, then suddenly brightened, and smiling broadly, she called out, I think what you mean is that Pando and all the other forests in the novel, they're not metaphors for the connections between the people. They're exactly how the people are connected. If anything, she added, all the other connections are metaphors for how the grove already connects to everything, including us. Think for a moment about Van Gogh's Subois painting, or a pipefish that coils into the shape of a deity, how observation and creation can entangle in a moment and produce an exuberant, enduring ecosystem of thought. That's what my student picked up on in that moment, and hers is the insight I would like you to take away today from these examples of a painting, a novel, and 7,000 years of storytelling in this, our time of deep crisis. Because we live in a time of accelerating environmental decline, some cruel and terrible futures are already foregone conclusions. We are going to need large-scale engineering, scientific, and political solutions to the wicked problems of climate change. But we're going to need something else, too, because our children are going to need their own rainbow serpents. We must rediscover the fact that everything our species crafts, every image, every story, reveals more of the wider world than the bits of reality it repeats. To the extent that we have forgotten in the late age of technoscience, this consolation of the oldest true stories, we must return to its embrace. We must begin to create new images and new stories as the world changes so that we will remember what we have lost and so that we may discover what we can find again. If I had only three words of advice to give you 
about your role in the necessary refashioning of the world, they would be this, cultivate vital connectivity. Even as we labor individually and together to find responses to the massive problems that face us in the century to come, listen and tell, paint and write and sing in ways that will recreate the world. Because art and storytelling are the most resilient and the most enduring technologies of humanity. Let's take that fact seriously. Let's create lasting beauty in our sorrow. Let's watch carefully for what washes on the shoreline and declare without apology its magical origins. Let's look deeply into the ancient entangled undergrowth of the world and find there again our most vital relation to it. Let's bear witness to the truth that it has always connected and that it can continue to connect to everything, including us. <laughs>